Welcome to the fourth lecture unit of Digital Control. This unit is given as a video for the first time and um, afterwards at the lecture times we will discuss um, whether you have questions. There will be a Q&A session. Let's start into chapter 352, General Procedures for Computing Pulse Transfer Functions. The impulse sampling at the input or at the output of a system has particular significance for us. When we look at a system, we see here the system G of S in the Laplace domain, in the continuous time Laplace domain. And we look, we investigate now if uh, we have an impulse sampler here at the beginning and also the cases where we have an impulse sampler at the output. So essentially what happens here is the following. We have a continuous time signal. That's a signal as we are used to from continuous time control systems. And this signal is being impulse sampled by some sampling time, let's say capital T. And then we produce at least as a model idea, a hypothetical signal x star, we will call that the start signal, which we described last time in the time domain as a sequence of Dirac delta pulses modulated by the values of x of t at the sampling times. Since that's Dirac, Dirac delta pulses, and in between the signal value is equal to zero, it's not, strictly speaking, a function um, that we can see it as, it's rather a distribution. We know the particular properties of the Dirac delta. Also in particular, it's infinite in value, or it does not get any particular finite value at the times, at sampling instances now. So what we can uh, say is that this signal cannot be realized, it's just a theoretical signal. We, um, we cannot realize such a signal on a signal line. But it's a mathematical framework that allows us to formulate in mathematical terms the ideal sampling with an ideal zero order hold and what happens to a system dynamics g of s driven by such a signal. So we have a well-defined Laplace formulation for this, uh, for this signal. We had that last time already. And we drive the system with such a signal. So this, this system is now excited by that signal and we want to investigate uh, what comes out. We already did that in the chapter before. So we formulated y of t. If you remember, I just scroll up here a little bit that has shapes like this, for example. So we will have a continuous time system response and something, some discontinuous um, effect basically happens at the sampling instances. For example, here and here and here for this particular plant that, that was exemplified there. Of course, we can always sample here the output signal again. And now it's of interest for us how we can actually describe the output signal, the sampled output signal in particular, as a function of x star and some form, some g star, as we will see afterwards. And that should be a model for our y star. Now let's see how that works and if that works and under which conditions. So we claim that we will have a form that we know already quite well. And just now that we speak of start quantities, so of a sampled signal at the output, at the input, so that's here the output signal, that's the input signal, and that we have something in between here, some representation of G, it's actually G star, it's not the same as G in that sense, but um, the point is that we want to make here the connection is that this claim says that what we claim here, and that's very important actually for our system treatment, 
is that by having this structure, in particular this sampler here at the input side, so that we feed the system with a sampled input signal like that, that we actually obtain this structure where we have a multiplication of a transfer function and of a signal, the input signal. And it's essential for simplicity that we can do that. Now, you might say that's, well, it's not a big deal. That's what we did always in the continuous case as well. In the continuous case, so if you were to feed x of s directly into g of s, of course, we would have y of s equals g of s x of s. So that's what we already know. But the point is that we live here in a different situation. Actually, x star is a very different signal, exciting g. Um, so that's, that's not self-evident that we actually will get to a similar structure. And it turns out that it is. And the point is that we can write, once that is established, we can also write that uh, this particular structure, this multiplication structure in the C domain. Okay, so that's basically you take um, the signal x star and have a direct representation of that in the Z domain. And as we'll see also, G star can be directly linked to G of Z. Okay, now let's say that all works. Um, that's a claim up until now. We'll just shortly prove that claim. So let's have a look at that. From the figure here, first of all, we can read off that we will have y of s equals g of s times the input signal x of s. So that's exactly what is written here, right? Now, when we actually take this y of s and feed it here through the sampler to obtain an expression of y star of s, right, in order to, to basically look at, at this equation. We want to get to this equation now. We read off that particular equation and now we want to see whether this all start equation is true. That's not so simple. We actually have to prove that. So the point is, um, that's an equation. We star, we apply the starring operation. That means the sampling operation on both sides of the equation. Essentially, we star that side of the equation and we star the entire side here of the equation, right? That's what we want to do now. So let's do that. Left, the left side is trivial. If that's what we just call y star. That's our definition, basically. Now we take the parentheses around this entire right-hand side expression and star it. So we apply to this result, which is again y of s, of course, um, the starring operation. And it will turn out that it actually becomes decomposed like this. Let's see how that works. For that, we actually insert into our uh, definition of what we mean by starring. We had that last time, so we had this definition and we used the complex Fourier series expansion to actually define what we mean by the, the signal x star or some object x star of s given or built up on the object x of s, so on this one. And we've seen that formulating x star means we have this, this fact in the front and then we have this infinite sum over all the Fourier modes and we sum up over frequency shifted versions of x. So x of s, x of s minus j omega s, x of s minus 2j omega s, and so on. And also for plus j omega s, plus j2 omega s, and so on. So that's, that's how we define the starring operation. Now let's try that on this entirety here of this expression. We'll just insert 329 into basically this, the structure of 330, or let's say we rewrite it by star, left-hand side, equals um, 329, right-hand side. And now we use this star, so we have this fact on the front, we have the summation here, and now we 
we come up with this parenthesis expression, this one here, and plug that in here. Okay. Now that's x star evaluated wherever we need it times g evaluated at the same frequency. Now we just have to make our way further and in particular what we use here is an observation that we can do is that if we look at a start signal here in x star we have a start signal and we look at it at a particular frequency shift by integer multiples of omega s like so then if you think of actually how the spectrum of x star looked like i just do a quick sketch here so we had basically the spectrum so omega is here and let's say here is x of j omega and let's say we had some spectrum which looks maybe like this bump it's a symmetric one and it's band limited somehow so that's plus minus omega one here so that's essentially that's my spectrum that's not everywhere, everywhere else it's zero now if we take that and literally i will copy that signal and construct my start signal now by taking infinitely many copies exact copies of my spectrum or of my signal content shifting it to higher frequencies and to in positive and negative directions and that goes on forever and that's now x star it's a star here x star of j omega so that's the start signals spectrum looks like this and now if you look back at our question here we want to have a look at x star of s shifted by integer multiples of omega s well it turns out that actually this distance here between the bumps is exactly omega s so in an integer number of shifts would just I do it in a different color would just reorient my coordinate system essentially by a multiple of omega s somewhere and looking at the, the blue coordinate system now the bumps all look the same we just shifted by one bump but it doesn't matter it's the signal exactly looks the same as if we were not to shift that because we have infinitely many copies lined up there at exact same distances so essentially we cannot distinguish frequency shifts by integer multiples of omega s in the spectrum of the start signal which means this is essentially the important result here that x star at integer shifts of uh, omega s is identical to x star of s and that's now nice for our purposes up here because what we wanted to do let's look up here what we wanted to do is we wanted to uh, simplify this expression and we can do that now because now we just established that x star at a frequency shift of some omega s's can be written in a simplified form and is equal and identical to x star of s now let's do that and the, the dependency on n vanishes in this in this particular factor it's not vanishing back here here we still have n left right we cannot do that back there but in the front here we can do that and going on that simplifies so we can actually um, come up with uh, collecting x star of s out of the summation so now we are left with a nice decomposition y star of s equals x star of s and this entire term here um, becomes something that we can call g star of s and actually it's uh, related you could uh, you, you could see it as interpreting g of s as a signal for example as the impulse response signal represented in s and we take this uh, the sampling operation and apply it to this signal now we in, re in, we reinterpret that again as a particular 
representation of a system dynamics and now we have a structure which we which has really advantages for us to have we have a multiplication of start quantities and that means if we scroll up again that means that we actually have a z domain expression where our output signal y of z is transfer function g of z multiplied by x of z. Okay, the next configuration we are looking into is if we do not have an impulse sampler at the input. So we have the situation that we have um, a continuous time signal x of s or x of lowercase t directly driving the system g of s which is a continuous time dynamic system. Then it produces an output y of s respectively y of t and then we sample the output and express the sampled output values. If we read off from this block diagram y of s that's of course g of s times x of s. We know how to compute that, how to work with the structure, and then we can apply the sampling operation, so this sampler here, and express y star of s. We will see that actually this corresponds to taking the product g of s, x of s in the s domain and then applying the sampling operation. And we will write that type of signal as gx and then parenthesis of s to indicate that we actually have to build this compound here in the s domain and we cannot explain the product which is built in the s domain by a multiplication in the z domain. That's the essential difference to the case before where we had an input sampler. Now we can take this compound, which is itself, of course, uh, a signal representation in S, and sample that, and we have the correspondence Y of Z is the Z transform of this S function here. And we call that GX of Z. That's not G of Z times X of Z. So that's not G of C times X of C in general. So we cannot derive a pulse transfer function G of C that doesn't exist. And that has far reaching consequences in our system representation and how we can work with such signals. That came from the fact that actually this signal up here, x of s, drives g of s and excites g of s at each and every point in time at the sampling instance, but also all the time points in between. And that is fundamentally different to an impulse sampled signal at the input, which can only affect the system at the sampling instance. Now finally, let's look at a situation where we have an input sampler, so a sampler at the input side, but for the time being, we look at the continuous time output signal y of t, respectively y of s. So let's see. Um, y of s is, of course, g of s times x star of s. That's just a multiplication in the s domain. Now, if we were to look at that signal y of t for t equals kt, then we can star that signal. So we pretend now that there is a sampler, we look at the signal at the sampled instances, we star this equation on both sides, we get y star of s equals the structure that we already know, g of s times x star of s starred and we've derived before in the first example, in the first case, that that amounts to a product of g star of s times x star of s and we could establish a direct correspondence to 
z domain objects g of z and x of z where x of z is the input signal in the z domain and g of z corresponds to the pulse transfer function so we have this nice multiplicative structure okay so that's the case when we have sampling at uh, the input because then we can actually take that apart like that and here we construct an expression of y of z um, of the sampled output now let's dive into um, how we see that i mean that's just what happens when you insert into the uh, starring operation with an input sampler as we did before but let's keep y of t defined on the real-time axis for the moment so we can inverse Laplace transform this product from the equation up here this product is now um, written out as using the convolution integral like so we have the integral from 0 to t so the time at which we evaluate this product this output signal um, and we construct the convolution in here the weighting function here at t minus tau tau is the running variable in this integral times x star of tau let's see how this works out or we insert the expression of x star here which we know from before that's the impulse train here modulated by the signal value of x at the corresponding times we see that we can just take this common factor into the summation which happens here we can exchange the sequence of integral and summation here so finally what we get is that the integrand can be evaluated using the blending property at the times where tau minus kt equals zero and then that gives us basically this expression and we know this expression already that is the convolution summation where we still have the weighting function in it with the real valued t here lowercase t so that's effectively a function in real time of course that's because we described y of t here and we can expect that for some uh, domain at least in t that will change somehow continuously and whenever we arrive at a sampling instant then we can expect some different behavior some discontinuity the c transform of the signal y evaluated at the sampling instances becomes when we just insert t equals n capital t n times the sampling time at the sampling instances then we speak of y of z that's the z transform of this very time signal this sequence and we just insert that into the definition of the z transform that's basically this guy and inside here we just take our expression of y of t evaluated at these sampling instance that goes in here all right so we do that and by rearranging the summations we can actually come to this line here and that will give us g of mt times x of kt to the power times z to the power of minus k plus m and we took the substitution that m equals n minus k here if we look at this form here we managed to actually decompose this product here that can be all written as some function let's say some function f1 of m t times some function 2 of kt and then we sum up over both indices over m and over k and we can uh, decompose such a structure just by multiplying it out and recollecting terms um, into actually 
the form that we see down here, the form that we have only the terms depending on M collected to one side and pulled out and effectively becoming a sum on their own times the entire summation of the terms in K. And when, when having written that, we can actually see that this corresponds to multiplying the, C, the, the expressions that define G of C, respectively X of Z. So now we came actually from an expression of the convolution summation and could show that we can decompose that into a product form. And that was basically to be expected, looking at the proofs above, but for completeness. And also now we have an, an expression here, um, which describes our continuous time output as a function of, of course, of time and of the input sequence. Let's have a look at an example. This example here shows the case is that we have an input sampler at the very beginning. So we have some input signal X star. We have, in this case, the zero order whole transfer function. That's H naught of S. We do not have an input sampler in between here. That's a continuous link, a continuous time link. So we have to resolve that in the S domain entirely. We have our planned transfer function, let's call it GP of S. And then we have Y of S. And we also look at the sampled version of it, Y star of S. So basically we have all these components in it. And we will resolve that, so we take uh, G of C, that's this entire transfer function, series collect connection of H0 times GP multiplied in the S domain, and then Z transforming that. Why? Because this compound transfer function here, we call it H0 GP of S, this product has an input sampler and the sampled output is observed so we are in the first case where we have samplers at both sides hence we take this compound transfer function multiplied in s and we take that into the z domain formally that goes like this we trans we see transform this s domain transfer function and we know how that looks like um, we will get one minus c to the minus one times the c transform of this transfer function, we can decompose this transfer function into partial fractions um, and then go into the correspondence table and directly solve for the z domain expressions for rho, for the unit ramp, which is 1 over s squared, then for the step or 1 over s, and then we have a first order. Um, term 1 over s plus 1, which becomes this third term in the z domain. And then we put it all on the same denominator here. And after multiplying that out, we'll get a second order numerator with some coefficients where we have, which, which are functions of the sampling time. So that would be a discrete time pulse transfer function g of z that describes let's write it down somewhere up here that describes y of z as the product of this pulse transfer function g of z that we got out down there times x of z as the sampled input signal in a z domain expression.